Thanks for joining us here on The Polls this afternoon. Ghana's Catholic Bishop Conference has released a public statement to the press backing the passage of the proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian Family Values Bill as Parliament reconvenes on the consideration of the anti-gay bill today. The passage of that bill has been generating a heated debate on the floor of the House with sponsors of that uh, bill in terms of MPs accusing some of their colleague MPs of undermining the legislation which will criminalize same-sex activities in Ghana. Well, Kukwa Santi is our parliamentary correspondent. Uh, he's been monitoring all of that uh, for us, joins us uh, live from the House. Uh, and Kukwa, let's first of all uh, start off from this latest concern we're getting uh, from the Catholic Bishops Conference. Uh, what are some of the details of the statement we're receiving? After so many months of waiting, the proper family value bill has finally had its time on the floor. The Speaker of Parliament ruled that despite the chairman being absent, members could move the amendments that were tabled in his name on behalf of his committee. The understanding is that in the absence of the chairman, any member of the committee could take up the... If the chairman is available, he will lead us. In the answer of the chairman, any member could take up the matter. Following this ruling, members on both sides came around the table and discussed some amendments that have been proposed. Amendment proposed, paragraph A, subparagraph 6, delete. So, Speaker, the reason for the deletion is that queer is an umbrella term used for people who are not heterosexuals, who are not six gender. Put the question. All those in favor of the deletion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The eyes have it. But not without some controversies. The majority chief whip came in and argued that some agreements with the minority leadership had been breached in terms of the order of business on the floor of the house. My colleague, my respected colleague, Nabo Sam John, was here. We are engaged. Yeah, but I just, just want us to get one thing clear. When we spoke, when you came here, we spoke. We agreed on the chronology of the flow of uh, activities or business. We said, we finished the question. When we finished the question, we have motions. We have three motions. And then we conclude the consideration of the proper human rights bill. Because, speaker, with respect, the majority leader had said that the special budget and the constitutional legal committee need needed him to be there for some consideration. So I thought, I thought, because I'm very interested in this bill, we also want to be here. And the majority leader has said that he wants to sit in whilst we are doing the consideration. The understanding we had between the majority and the minority and your good self was that after we are done with the questions, we will start the consideration of Ghanaian values and what's the full name of that bill? Uh, uh, the Proper Human Sexual Rights and Ghanaian Family Value Bill 2021. That was the understanding. Well, the Speaker of Parliament overruled him and the business continued. You simply guide me. I'm not a robot. It doesn't mean that when you guide me, I must, by order, go by your guidance. At some point, they had to haggle over whether or not to delete the word proper from the rendition of the title of the bill. I believe that whatever this house will pass will be considered as the objective test in Ghana. And so if we are dropping proper, whatever this house will pass is known as a proper law anyway. So if we drop proper, once it becomes an act of parliament, it is the proper law in Ghana. So we do not necessarily have to have it in defining human sexual rights. So the word proper be consequentially deleted throughout the bill. So it doesn't say proper human sexual rights. Because the constitution does not mandate the pri a private member's bill that imposed a charge on the consolidated fund, majority leader. The consideration stage of the bill now underway. Very soon, we can expect that this bill will move to the third reading stage and could be passed. And if all that we've seen today on the floor is anything to go by, it means 
the Speaker of Parliament's promise that this bill could be passed before the House went on Christmas break could actually be realized. Reporting for Joy News, Kweku Asante, Parliament House, Accra. Well, uh, the latest we're getting on this is that the Ghana Catholic uh, Bishop Conference has released a statement uh, giving its full backing to the passage uh, of this bill. We can bring you excerpts of which you see on the screens right now, uh, indicating that in, uh, of course, uh, this connection, we can quote state that the draft bill on the promotion of proper human sexual rights in Ghanaian Family Values Bill uh, currently in Parliament is in the right direction. It seeks to enact laws against uh, criminal homosexual acts. The bill aims to provide uh, for proper human sexual rights and also Ghanaian uh, family values uh, and also prescribe LGBTQ plus and related activities as well as provide the protection uh, for children and persons who are victims or accused of uh, the activities of the LGBTQ community. And they wrap up by saying the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit uh, be with uh, every Ghanaian. And, of course, that statement is signed by the uh, president of the Catholic Bishops' uh, Conference, Reverend uh, Matthew Kweku uh, Jane Fee. And, of course, uh, Kweku Asante is joining me now via uh, Zoom. Uh, Kweku, we know that this is supposed to be considered uh, on the floor of the House uh, shortly. What are we to expect today? The bill is still at the consideration stage currently in the House. In fact, on Friday, the House began that consideration even without the chairman of the Constitutional Parliamentary and Legal Affairs Committee. And the expectation is that they will continue today. As of today, no work has been done on the bill so far, but it's still on the other paper, and the expectation is that that will be done. In fact, Sam George is still on the floor. A lot of responders are still here. And if the Speaker of Parliament is to stay true to the promise he made, that this bill will be passed before the House adjourns for Christmas break in December or on December 2022, then the House will have to do some more work on this now. This new message that has come from the Catholic Bishop Conference obviously is going to bolster the it's going to bolster Parliament and the sponsors to try and push this through because clearly the 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 the, the, the pastors and the, the the economical community in the country clearly say that this is something that they are backing. They say the state has the power to do so. And if you clearly read from the passage out, the statement that has been put out by the Catholic Bishop Conference, which is really has, having come up strongly within the prisons of parliament. And I'm sure today, when the consideration state takes off again, this will be referenced as one of the reasons why parliament must do this. So, mm. bless that we are waiting for this item that is prominent on the agenda today to be taken so that the family, uh, the, the proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values bill will continue on at the consideration stage. The cross-by-cross -cross consideration will continue up until they finish the movie to tell you. Uh, Kweku Asante is in Parliament for us and the world is just uh, reeling from uh, the celebration of International Human Rights Day with the Commission of Shraj meeting uh, CSOs and other stakeholders uh, in that space today. Joseph Wittal says his outfit has grave concerns about the anti-LGBT bill which has passed uh, the consideration state in Parliament. He's been speaking to uh, the press a while ago. Pick my source from the Universal Periodic Review report uh, 2022 Ghana came up very well recommended recommended in terms of what Ghana has done in promoting and protecting human rights at the Human Rights Council but the peers of Ghana have also indicated to Ghana areas of concern that they think Ghana should work on. And some of those areas are part of what we have discussed today. Yeah. What is the view of Shraj on that? The view of Shraj has been captured by the, in, in our memorandum to Parliament, and it's in, on the net. We have raised very pertinent concerns of the constitutionality of some of the provisions and clauses of the bill. I see from the beginning of the discussions on or the consideration stage that our concerns, some of them are even beginning to be addressed. But the key ones that relate to uh, freedom of expression, the right not to sympathize with any person 
who professes that type of orientation uh, and some institutions having to undertake some um, education on the bill when it becomes law, we, we think it's quite problematic. Because you can ask the, 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 the charge, which is supposed to prote promote and protect the rights of all persons, to particularly indicate and, or advocate or train or educate people only on aspects of the provisions of that bill. We can do that. Two, you can ask the courts to give their judgment in a certain direction. But I think all these things would be addressed. Fortunately, the commission uh, is, in, is in good uh, standing with some of the provisions which the Attorney General also provided to Parliament. I mean, and Parliament seems to be agreeable to those amendments. I hope as the consideration state goes on, we will see our concerns being addressed. Uh, well, it's a good time to bring in Genevieve Partington, uh, who's the country director for Amnesty International, a human rights organization, uh, pushing for a wide range of issues, not just on the anti-LGBTQ. Uh, in fact, they uh, were part of the deliberations on human rights today when the uh, Shraj Balls, of course, uh, made that engagement. Genevieve, it's good to be talking to you at this time. Let's start off uh, from the concerns Shraj is now raising with our anti-LGBTQ bill, uh, the concerns about unfair treatment and also gagging some state institutions. These are concerns you equally share, I believe. Of course. Again, thank you for having me. Um, yes, as you are aware, um, we are celebrating Human Rights Day. It was celebrated yesterday. And it's 75 years since um, the um, institutionalization of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, yes, I know that Parliament is seriously deliberating on issues that really concern um, minority populations or vulnerable groups, and this will definitely affect um, human rights of specific groups of people. And absolutely, I agree with um, the commissioner of Shraj that, uh, you know, gagging certain institutions would be what would happen in terms of our mandate. Shraj, for example, uh, cannot exclude a specific group of people as um, it's supposed to be fighting for the human rights of everyone, regardless of sex, sexual orientation, gender, religion, disability or not. So it's going to be actually very problematic if should this uh, bill be passed, it's going to be very problematic for um, some of us, especially the CSOs that do a lot of work within this sector, um, you know, to be able to reach out to these vulnerable communities. Um, it's going to be a huge work for UN AIDS, for example. Um, already having access to health is a crucial issue for vulnerable communities such as the LGBTI. Um, they try and get access to health facilities and it's a problem because of the stigma sometimes. Um, I must say Ghana is you know, relatively, to some extent, a safer place than other countries who are completely against um, the LGBTI community. But a lot of work has to be done. And as we celebrate Human Rights Day, there, there are other bills in Parliament that I wish to speak about. That is the Affirmative Action Bill, mm -hmm. which we are happy that the Speaker of Parliament has given a certificate of urgency to and has assured us that it will receive the attention it needs. In fact, we'll deal, with, like that. Parliament... We'll, we'll, we'll deal with that and also, for instance, the witchcraft accusation bill, which is, which is also a, cri a critical piece of uh, document that we need to look at. But just to uh, close the chapter on this anti-LGBT issue, the question about you know, trying to engage Parliament once more, because if Shraj is raising the concern, uh, it goes to, to the heart of the matter that most of you in the C CSO space, uh, those fighting for human rights, still have concerns about the uh, piece of legislation. Don't you feel that you have another opportunity at least to engage Parliament, to engage Parliament and to try and make a case? W what's been that yes. difficulty in just trying to, to engage? So we've already we've already presented a memo to Parliament, just like what Attorney General's Office has done. Shraj has done that. Amnesty International has also presented a memo to Parliament. We will be doing that again, reiterating why this bill shouldn't be passed. 
there are so many articles in the bill that are very problematic and it doesn't necessarily, everyone should be concerned about this bill. It targets allies. And when I say allies, it targets you and me. That means if you associate yourself with someone who is part of that community, you can go to jail. If you, um, you know, if, if, if you are a landlord, perhaps, and you have persons who are suspected of LGBTI activity, um, you know, you can go to jail if you don't report them. It's going to push people out on the streets. There are already forced evictions happening because persons are suspecting that persons are part of the LGBTI community. Forced evictions are happening. Human rights abuses, physical assaults. These cases are being reported on a daily basis to the Ghana police and to some of our CSOs that monitor these activities like the uh, CDD Ghana. So it's actually happening. Maybe the media doesn't necessarily cover it um, totally, but these things are happening now just because of the bill being in parliament. So it's going to be worse once the bill is passed. And I feel like we really need to understand that we are all human beings regardless, and we deserve the same rights. We deserve to be treated equally, regardless of our sexual orientation, sex, gender, or, or a disability. So this is something that, you know, we need to do a lot of public education on. And Ghana joining the Human uh, Rights Council, we, we have to understand that we are a pedestal and we need to uphold certain values of international human rights law. Thank I you. See. Uh, let's now move on, talk about, you know, uh, the broad spectrum of human rights um, you know, activities here in Ghana. Of course, we're just uh, moving out of that celebration over the weekend uh, for international human rights. The, the question as to how the country generally is faring, and this is an area that Amnesty International has been focused on, uh, looking at the uh, broad based issues of human rights in Ghana. How, how are we faring as a country? Well, we right now I feel like Ghana is like a yo-yo when it comes to human rights. We, it's one step forward, one step back. Um, we we make promises and then we go back on them. I'll give you an example. The parliament voted in favor of the witchcraft accusations bill, and then now the president did not assent to the bill. Um, we're still waiting on the president to present a memo to the speaker of parliament to um, tell us exactly why. Um, you know, details, not just the letter that he sent to the speaker of parliament. Details specifying what exactly is the challenge with the bill. We'll talk about the death penalty as well. You know, for the death penalty bill, there were two amendments, amendments of the Criminal Offenses Act and amendments of the Armed Forces Act. So the president only signed, uh, assented to the, the amendments of the Criminal Offenses Act, but he did not sign, to, uh, sign into law the Armed Forces Act which is the same challenge that the witchcraft accusations bill is facing currently. So I, I know this was not really, um, you know, publicized much, but this is, this is the problem uh, we are facing currently. And, um, you know, we need to understand what exactly is going on with, uh, with these bills. And then, and then we look at the affirmative action bill, mm -hmm. which has been in parliament since 2011, you know, not just, we're not just celebrating Human Rights Day. Human Rights Day was the climax, climax of activities for 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. And the theme for that particular um, you know, um, campaign is invest to prevent violence against women and girls. That means more action needs to be taken by Ghana to ensure that women in all their diversity, live free of violence and coercion. How do we do that? We need to pass the Affirmative Action Bill. Mm -hmm. And this is something that, I, like I said previously, that the Speaker of Parliament said they'll definitely ensure that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, strides are made on this yeah, bill. But, but it's always been a challenge, you know, talking about that bill, uh, which has spun the life of many parliaments. Uh, the, the point about whether or not women should bring their seats to the table, or we create a space for them. That's been the very sharply divided debate that, that's always confronted this bill. Where, where should we be starting off from? Legislation or trying to push much more women into uh, positions of influence and power? Both, both. Because the thing is, um, 
in order to push women into decision-making roles, into positions of power, you need to do capacity building. You need to empower women. Um, what challenges are women facing that they aren't able to step forward and, and take these roles? You'll hear recently that for the first time, University of Development Studies has a female SRC president, for example. When you look at even our senior high schools, uh, when you hear who is the head prefect, it's a boy. Who is the head prefect? It's a boy. Rarely would you find a head prefect being a girl, of course, mm. unless it's a girl's school. Um, so uh, these are some of the things we need to start in our society, doing this social, uh, social behavioral change within our society to empower women and push, the, build their confidence so that they know that they can stand for these positions. Also, the bill is not suggesting that we just put women into uh, decision-making roles without the uh, capacity. Mm. The women that we are talking about will have the capacity and it will be quality, quality women that will be put in these roles. So there's just a percentage, 30% that we are asking, requesting that, uh, you know, are put women are put into a minimum, mm. are put into decision-making roles. And I could say for a fact that there have been several discussions with the prominent political parties on how best we can do that. So there's there's a consultative discussion going on. I see. Uh, and just to point out also that the local level elections are coming up, you expect more women to be a part of it, I guess. I hope. I hope. <laughs> and this is something we need. You know, it's, it's all about women's participation. What are we doing as CSOs, for example, to push women to stand? All, all this is not just about... Confidence building is also about funding, resources. Do these women have the money to stand for these positions? So there's a lot to be done in that aspect. And I know several um, CSOs and political parties are working in on this particular area. Okay, uh, let's uh, wrap up with my space. I'm a journalist and of course I should be concerned about the space. Uh, you know, the last report um, issued by uh, Reporters Without Borders um, raising concerns about free speech and the crackdown on, you know, uh, those in the uh, press. From your uh -huh. assessment, has that, you know, trajectory changed and how should we be working as a country to improve that area? Yes. So in terms of uh, freedom of expression, especially with our media, and um, they have they have actually been this. These are statistics eh, by we Media Foundation for West Africa. There has been an increase, significant increase on med on um, attacks on journalists, um, you know, um, abusing their human rights within this um, period of governance. And um, I hear it was lower. Um, the, uh, when during Mahama's uh, period of governance. So this is something that we need to really uh, look at. Uh, why has it increased? Why are security forces, why do security forces feel that they can attack journalists? And what are we also doing as a people to protect our journalists? I've heard several stories of where journalists have been attacked, tried to take matters into court, or to get the police to do something about it, and nothing was done. So how are we protecting our, our journalists? What, what more can we do? So, you know, the, the research, the evidence-based research, exposing these attacks is one thing that we need to continue doing. I know the media is very good on that. We need to continue gathering evidence, and we need to name and shame. The authorities that are, are doing this, mm. we need to call them out yeah. and we need to, they need to face repercussions. Well, us. on this, I just say journalism is not a crime, but I'm grateful uh, for spending some time with us. Uh, Jennifer Fartington, Country Director, Amnesty International. Uh, this afternoon as well, Mass Action for Sustainable Development in Africa, Master, a non-government organization, is calling on members of parliament on both sides of the house not to ratify the controversial lithium lease agreement between the government of Ghana and Barari TV Ghana Limited. Well, according to the group, uh, the hasty nature of the deal leaves room for suspicion, hence the need uh, to pull the brakes uh, and to push for wider consultations. Uh, we can hear from Atik uh, Mohammed, who is the executive director of the group, who addressed journalists on this matter. Ghana, as a lithium-blessed nation, must position itself in a good stead to reap the benefits from these green minerals. 
We must therefore avert the recurrence of the tragedy that has characterized the mining of gold. We need, as a matter of urgency, to pay attention to the issue of lithium. We find the mining lease agreement between government of Ghana and Barari DV Ghana Limited unacceptable and not fit for purpose. And we'll tell you why we think this is so. First, we need to focus, let's look at the issue of royalty rate. The lease agreement stipulates in clause 20 that the company shall pay a royalty, and by company I'm referring to Barari DV Ghana Limited, that the company shall pay a royalty of 10% of total revenue. And although Section 25 of Act 703, and this is the Minerals and Mining Act, as amended, creates room for setting of royalty rates higher than the earlier 5%, it does not set a specific rate. But it does not mention a specific royalty rate. Now, therefore, the 10% rate, rate which the minister in this new agreement has set is discretionary and arbitrary. The implication is that Ghana might be earning less royalty income in the future from lithium, when prices skyrocket, a phenomenon that is most likely in the light of the projected uh, mad lithium rush. So there is that projected you know, um, increase in demand for lithium, which means that there's going to be an obvious increase in prices in the future. There seems to be hasty and suspicious grant. I mean, the grant of the lease seems to be hasty and suspicious. And we'll tell you why we think it is hasty and suspicious. Given that green minerals, and especially lithium, will become substitutes for oil in the not distant future, one would expect wider engagements and consultations, at least in the manner of those that characterize the discovery of oil prior to the grant of any mining lease. It is obvious this did not happen. The curious question then is, why the rush? What does it profit Ghana to rush into signing lease agreements only to be hurt in the long run? An important and, quite frankly, uh, disturbing issue is also the fact that when you carefully study the approval, of the approval of recommendation letter, so usually when you apply for a mining lease, Minerals Commission does its work and then they make recommendation to the minister. The minister then sends what they call approval of recommendation letter. When you study that letter, which was written by the minister, and then you compare that to the mining lease agreement which was eventually signed, you would realize that both the approval of recommendation letter and the mining lease bear the same date. This is very suspicious because it is impracticable for the processes after the approval of recommendation to be fulfilled and the lease granted in one day, cages or concerns in the agreement. To this end, we are calling, our, we are calling on our representatives in parliament, and we mean both sides on the aisle, not to ratify the agreement in its current form until the building blocks are laid. Hey, I take uh, Mohammed is uh, joining us in studio now uh, for more uh, discussions on this. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us. The point about, uh, you know, the Land and Natural Resources Minister, and they, they keep repeating the point that, look, yes, you might have concerns about the arrangement, but this is the best we could get for the country, 10%. Um, royalty arrangements and also there's the opportunity uh, for a public listing to allow Ghanaians to equally invest into this uh, mineral royalty scheme. What else could you get if it's not your money going into all of this? I thank you very much. So to say that um, they are getting us 10% royalty rate, this is a rate that could change in future in the sense that if, for example, there were to be another applicant for a lease, it is likely that we will not be getting 10%. The reason simply being that the law as we have it today gives discretion to the minister to determine the royalty rate. And the rate is not specified in the law. So it is up to the minister to decide whether I'm going to negotiate for 8%, 2%, 1%. So our argument is that this is a pioneer agreement. Lithium is the future. Very soon, oil is not going to be of any use to us, literally speaking. Yeah. So if lithium is a new oil, you want to have an arrangement such that Ghanaians will continue to benefit from this new oil, so to say, in the long term. So 10% is no benefit at all for you? Not necessarily, but it is not cast in a watertight manner that would allow subsequent leases to follow suit. What's the alternative then? Because that's what every Ghanaian is looking for. Um, looking at the requirements of the law and what it is that um, you need in terms of even exploration. We, we didn't have the capacity. This is a private firm that, that made its uh, commitment, put its money into this whole scheme, 
we, we couldn't be asking for more. Do you do you agree? You see, this is the, this is a defeatist argument. We keep right. saying, oh, Ghanaians cannot afford to right. you know expend on exploration. Mm. This was the same argument we advanced when we sold our gold out to foreign investors for right. free. Mm. And that agreement, I mean, that scheme hasn't helped us in any way. To the extent that we were getting between 3% and 5% royalty, mm. later it was modified and so on. My argument is that mm. I'm not saying that 10% mm. is less or more. Mm. Open up the conversation. Let a lot more stakeholders have, a, I mean, have uh, their say on this. But at the end of the day, we, if we are saying that 10% is what is ideal, it is what is good, put it in the law such that no future minister or such that subsequent leases would not say that, look, for us, we don't agree to the 10%. Because the law does not say it should be 10%. Right. It only says the minister has the power to determine or okay. prescribe the rate. It's, and here's what I'll say. It's very easy to raise concerns about this framework. But let's look at the master solution, for example. What are you proposing, um, which in your estimate will bring much more yields to the country, different from what the minister is doing now? Good. So our solution is twofold. You know, so it is either the first thing is right. we either amend the Minerals and Mining Act as we currently have it, mm -hmm. because, like I said, lithium and other green minerals are not like the normal gold diamonds that we have. Mm -hmm. So it has to be taken care of by a different regulatory or fiscal regime. So, and the way to do it, you know, is either first you amend the Minerals and Mining Act to make sure that the royalty rate that we're talking about, if Ghanaians agree that ten percent is is ideal, is sustainable then let's put it in the law that says that when it comes to lithium, unlike other minerals, when it comes to green minerals specifically, right. the royalty rate should be 10%. So in the future, no minister can change it. And subsequent leases... But, but this is the minister who's in charge now, who's signing no, a deal. No. He He's tells you it's a 10% regime. No. What's the fear about that? You doubt him? No, I'm not... You see... This is the yeah, argument. But that's a more straight question. Yeah. You doubt the minister? The no, I don't doubt that. It's in the lease. Right. Okay. So right. That, that is not in doubt. But Precisely. I'm saying, no, but I'm saying that... Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that all other leases will go by the 10%. You understand? Mm -hmm. Because the law does not state that the royalty has to be 10%. In fact, he had an opportunity to make it so, so that subsequent leases, and even if a future minister comes, it would still stay 10%. Mm -hmm. But we can have a situation where by subsequent leases, you won't get the 10%. And that is what we are seeing. You see, the law, when we amended the Minerals and Mining Act in 2015, that gives him the power. When you look at Section 110, uh, subsection U of it, it tells you that the minister is empowered to go, I mean, to make regulations by way of ally. That will determine or prescribe the royalty rate. So if he were minded to do Ghana a great deal of good, he would have, before this agreement, he would have preceded it with an ally that says that as far as lithium goes, the royalty rate is going to so be 10%. So your, your, your summary, this is a bad deal. It is a deal that could be made better. Okay. And so let's, let's talk about the, the parliamentary solution you're is also seeking to explore because that's part of the conversation. So, you are asking Parliament not to uh, ratify the international agreement because, by law, without the ratification, uh, the deal is out, yeah, the out of the way. Okay, so let's talk about that. What are you asking Parliament to do on this? Good. The first thing we're asking them to do is to first refuse to ratify this. And once they do that, now the opportunity is then afforded us to have further conversations. Broaden the conversation. Because I do not see why we are in a rush. It's not as if, if we don't sign this lease, Ghana is going to come to an end. It's, we made similar mistakes with gold. So we learned from that and said, look, we want to avert the tragedy that characterized um, gold and gold mining. So when it came to oil, we took our time. We even have a, an, a Petroleum Revenue Management Act. Mm -hmm. Similar thing ought to be done when it comes to this. Because this is, like, like I said, the new oil. Right. So you cannot run it like business as usual. It cannot be managed under the same fiscal and regulatory regime like diamonds and gold. So if parliament does not ratify the present lease agreement, mm -hmm. then we can proceed to say that, look, we need to either amend the existing act or come up with an entirely okay. How new about legislation? looking at it from this way? Get parliament to have all of the parties involved in this deal sit down and get a good deal. That is an option. That is, um, you cannot do that if you, don't, if you proceed to ratify yeah, but, but it. throwing everything out of the window no, is no, not no, the no, solution. No, I'm not saying, you see? Yes. Why? If you proceed to ratify okay. it, you, you see, Parliament, I'm not sure, has the power to amend okay. the agreement. Right. Because for them to amend it, the law says... Because you feel negotiations be, are, are already... Usually it has to be between but, but I'm raising that because of the possibility 
uh, of, of fair reasoning. This is a, a private um, interest company, uh, Barari uh, DV. Mm -hmm. They would want to sit down with the Parliament of Ghana knowing that they're going to operate in this country. Oh, no, I mean, that is fair, but yeah. Parliament can only have that conversation, and that is what I'm talking about. Yeah. They need to broaden the conversation. Mm -hmm. Why is it that Parliament in the first place mm -hmm. was not invited into the conversation? Yeah. So you can only have that conversation if this ratification is... is, is is kept on hold. Mm -hmm. But if we proceed to do the ratification, what conversation are you then going to have as parliament? Okay, and your own interest group also, um, you, you say that you, you care for the people of Ghana, you want to, of course, uh, push this um, movement because of the interests of the people of Ghana. What will you do in the event that we have parliament approving this uh, arrangement and also the minister going ahead, uh, ahead with the 10% royalty? So, as for going ahead with the 10%, there are several things we can do. Look, no, I mean, what do you plan to do? Well, of course, um, as good people of this country, there are laws that allow us to express ourselves in different ways. Right. There are several types of symbolic speeches we can engage in. But I am very hopeful that our representatives will do good by us. Mm -hmm. They will be driven and, and guided by their conscience. Mm -hmm. They will not be driven by partisanship and other considerations. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the most unlikely event that they do not allow themselves to be guided by all these considerations, mm -hmm and decide to ratify this problematic uh, lease agreement. Mm. Uh, there are other avenues. In yeah. fact, yeah. there is a saying in, in tree that if a kid who does not allow the mother to sleep would neither know sleep. I so think, and I guess that threat, <laughs> that threat is Absolutely. to the sector minister. Uh, some and to Jina, but, uh, themselves. I, I get that. But will you engage them? Of course. So mm -hmm. part of um, the steps we are we willing to take, we stated it in, in our press conference, is to hold public fora. Because not a lot of people actually understand the importance of what is going on. Mm -hmm. Like I said, very soon, the proceeds we are getting, look, our annual budget funding amount yeah. is funded from proceeds of oil. So if that is not coming, imagine with all these, we are still having issues to do with, you know, fiscal imbalances and so on. So if that stream stops coming mm. and you have a bad deal as far as the term goes, where do you think Ghana is going to, yeah. to be headed? So people need to understand the importance of this. Mm. People need to understand what it means when we say that we must have a new or separate uh, regulatory and fiscal regime mm. for lithium and other green minerals. So there's going to be public fora, engage a lot of civil society organizations and other stakeholders. I see. Uh, and, and I take uh, one more opportunity for you. Perhaps um, the presidency is listening now. What, what will be the message? Because that might be the only way out now. The, 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 the message would be, let the minister hold on. In fact, you don't even need to proceed to present the lease agreement to parliament for ratification. They should hold on to it, call for fresh negotiations, mm. and engage as many people as possible. I am sure in the course of the engagements, some of the pitfalls that we identify with the lease agreement, I'm sure could have been averted. Mm. Because if the president really wants to leave a legacy that is sustainable, that is the way to go. Otherwise, if you don't and you proceed with the ratification, sending it to parliament, they are saying by March of next year they want to do that. Look, we are saying that hold on to the submission of this lease agreement to parliament. Mm. Open up the conversation. After all, it's not... It's not been consummated yet. Mm -hmm. It's just a lease agreement. Yeah. It only becomes consummate after the ratification. Mm -hmm. So the parties themselves know that if they call back the document, it is still you know, in order. It is not as if they are shortchanging the investors. Yeah. So that we can all come up with a framework that is helpful to the investors and helpful to us Ghanaians. I see. Uh, we wait to see what the outcome will be. Uh, I take grateful for your time here on the Join News channel. And you're watching the polls uh, here on the Join Your Channel. When we get back, we'll tell you about uh, the decision of the Kaneshi District Court, which has now granted bail to Shalima uh, Abusi, the spokesperson of the new force. We'll tell you what the supporters of this uh, emerging political group has been doing today uh, at the court. We have the latest for you. We are also foreigners elsewhere, right? And so how we treat how we will want to be treated elsewhere is the same way we should be treat other people here. Of course, uh, there's a lot uh, unfolding as uh, this afternoon the Kaneshi District Court has granted bail to Shalima Beauty, spokesperson for the new force. Well, she's been accused of uh, obtaining a student permit by false declaration. Uh, Shalima has pleaded not guilty to the charges. Richard Kojinyako, my colleague, was in court today and comes through with this report. So spokesperson for the new force, Shalima Abuisi, has been granted bail by a Kaneshi 
district court. Um, the bill sum is 20,000 Ghana cities with two charities to be justified. In fact, she's been accused or charged with the offense of obtaining student permits with false declaration. As we speak now, the legal processes are ongoing to ensure that the wishes of the courts, that is the granting here of the bill, is actually satisfied. But they are in the process of inspecting the premises or the facilities of the people, the, the charities that are readily available here. But down here, there are hundreds of people that have come in solidarity of Shalima Abuisi. They say that the rule of law should happen. They should not trample upon her fundamental human rights. They've already detained her for the past seven days. In fact, in court, uh, she pleaded not guilty to the charge. The state prosecutors have been conversing that she obtained her student permit under false pretenses. The fact that she says that she is a student of the Ghana Christian University College, according to the state prosecutors, that is not true because the university has actually written to them. And so they are in to prove whether she is a student or not. And they found her activities on social media advocating a new political party. And so the state is interested in the activities of Shalima Abuisi. We've been speaking with some of the people that have come here to lend their support to Shalima. That's what they have to say. Ah, yes, so you are meeting there, what I say? You are my friends. Shelly. Madam Shelly. Shelly, you're free. Oh, you're not going to work with your cancer circle, Haya, Accra, Haya. Onu onu ane bua ye ma mena ane bua ni tine wa se so munda anu because onu ane bua e kaka kaka. They can say we don't have nothing to say. All we say is free Shelly because she has been feeding a lot of people on the street. Yes. A lot of people are dying. A lot of people need redemption. And Ghana here. And Ghana here. I see that there is no peace. There is no peace. All we see is police and no justice. All we see is police. So we need a freedom now. It's a new Ghana, a new face of Ghana, and a new people. Free Shelly. Free Shelly. So, 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 so where do you, where do you know Madam Shelly? Madam Shelly, really, we know her. She has been a, um, let's say, a dual citizen of Ghana. Yeah, she's a half citizen of Ghana. And we know her. And we know her from the grassroots. It's not today. We've been working for her. She has a lot of entities. So we say, Free Shelly. For how long have you known her? Oh, really? I've known Madam Shelly for about eight years now. Because of Madam Shelly. So what has Madam Shelly done? I don't know. You don't know. Yeah. But you just came. Yeah. I mean, which people asked you to come? My brothers. Your brothers? Yes. So where are they? Are they also here? Yes. What did they tell you before you followed them? They tell me, say, make her come help them to come see Madam Shelly. Uh, but you know Madam Shelly? No. You've spoken to her before? You don't no, know. but I see her for graphic. Graphic? Yes. So that's the only place that you've seen her? Yes. Okay. So from here, what, what's going to happen? After uh, she's been told to, uh, she's been told that she's been granted bail. Obviously, so she's a hairdresser. Um, and then she also came to support. She said that she was informed by the brothers to come here to support uh, the freedom movement that they are advocating. Now, lawyer for Shalima Abuisi, Francis Xavier, so she says that they are happy with the court decision. At least they know that every offense is bailable and the court has indeed clearly stated so and so they are going through the processes speak now the sureties are willing ready and available to go and sign the bill in fact we have the uh, uh, ghana cards and documents which they have supplied to the register of the court uh, we are just waiting for their homes to be inspected so that she will be released on bail it's quite unfortunate that while this process is going on the nib is insisting that they want to take her to their custody. That we won't agree. Because as a matter of law, when a person is granted bail, the person becomes a prisoner of the court. It means that you brought the person to court and the court is dealing with the person. When the court has looked at the situation, looked at the factual situation and admitted the person to bail, you are expected to respect the order of the court. And that is why we are here. And I am going to be here until the order is executed because it's quite unfair to this young person, you know, to be holding her for the last seven days, for what? For a felony? 
I mean, this is really unacceptable and, and we are not going to allow it. What is happening now that we want to go and keep her and until whatever, I mean, very, very respectfully, that will be an abuse. It will violate her right to fair trial. It will have violate her right to freedom of movement. It will violate her right not only under the Constitution of Ghana, but under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I mean, the UN Convention on, uh, on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. I mean, the, 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 how do you treat a foreigner like that on your land? Ghanaians are also, we are also foreigners elsewhere, right? And so how we treat, how we want to be treated elsewhere is the same way we should be treat other people here. So if you have an issue, no problem. You brought the matter to court. The court has admitted the person to bail. Please, let's release her on bail. In the Kaneshi District Court, my name is Richard Kwejenyaku for Joy News. And still in politics, uh, we take you to uh, parts of the Volta region where a group of polling station constituency and tertiary wing executives of the new patriotic party in that part of the country are endorsing Ghana's energy minister, Dr. Matthew Pugu Prempe, as their preferred running mate for the 2024 presidential race. The group uh, describes the Mencia South lawmaker as a towering political figure capable of promoting harmony within the new patriotic party, making him more suitable for that role, presidential a uh, candidate of the governing New Patriotic Party, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, a couple of days back, asked for more time to nominate his running mate for the party's uh, Council of Elders. Uh, but the group calling itself Grassroot for, grassroot, uh, for Napo say the Energy Minister uh, and the four-term MP will be the best choice for the party. Eric uh, Dumano Akachi has been speaking on behalf of that group. Napo has distinguished himself as a minister with outstanding leadership and support for reform initiatives at the ministries of education and energy, respectively. He successfully led the implementation of the government flagship program, the free senior high school policy. As you can recollect, this major initiative was pooped by our political opponents as Bay to Hugwing and Kajo Ghanaian voters. That notwithstanding, Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe was able to oversee the implementation of the free SHS policy amidst stiff opposition and war propaganda by distractors of the government. Napo remained firm, confident, and bold in decision making throughout the initial implementation stages of this complex policy initiative. In his capacity as energy minister, Dr. Prempe had has guided players in the energy industry through significant transformational vision areas, such as maintaining the nation's electrical supply and enabling the constant supply of petroleum products at reasonable cost. In addition, Dr. Prempe oversaw the creation of Ghana's energy transition framework, which offers a precise roadmap for the country's fair and reasonable transition it will be remembered that in 2022, the Africa Public Sector Conference and awards recognized Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe as the best minister. Support for party activities. Napo is passionate about the MPP and extends a helping hand to support most party activities across the country. He contributed heavily to almost all programs of the party in the Ashanti region. Napo is known to have extended his benevolence and support to the party to several parts of the region, including Volta, OT, northern regions, and several of our constituencies in other regions. Support and relationship with the youth. If there is anybody in this government who believes in the youth and resonates with them, it is Dr. Matthew Opoku Prempe. He is a father figure who gave many young people across the country several opportunities. He gives a listening ear to the young people, irrespective of their tribe, party, or religion. It is unbelievable, yet true, that Napo has time to engage any young person who reaches out to him via WhatsApp amidst his heavy shadow. What manner of man is 
uh, well, the group uh, has been calling on the Council of Elders and all other uh, leading figures within the party to implore the vice president to consider a candidate or a running mate from the Ashanti region, specifically uh, Dr. Matteo Bogubrempa. Eric uh, Dumenuakachi is uh, joining us uh, briefly for a conversation on this. Uh, thank you, sir. And when you say you're grassroots for Napo, are you, um, you know, members of the NPP, specifically what's uh, the, the membership of this group? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are all, we are all members of the party. Myself, I'm even a constituency executive, and there are several uh, others who are polling station executives. Uh, and and w when you say that you are all executives, uh, you know that the uh, general secretary of the party has been giving it uh, the the directives on how campaigning should go. Um, you know, going forward, you are executives of the party. You don't want to be taking sides at this moment. Uh, for now, we, it's not a campaign, it's a call. Uh, we want to break the eight. And if you want to break the eight, you are looking at several factors. As we indicated, we stated in our press release that um, Ashanti region is a stronghold. If you look at the votes clearly in the pre uh, presidential primaries, you will notice that Amensha South delivered massively for Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. That's a resounding 85.5%. And it tells you that for anybody who wants to win an election, you must have an endorsement, overwhelming endorsement of the people. So for Napo being there, it's, a, it's an indication that he has been able to marshal the forces behind him and, and Dr. Baumia within Mensha South a constituency. And if you go to Ashanti region, he has touched many lives. Uh, we are in a situation where we need to win massively in the Ashanti region, we need uh, someone. And, and just to be and just to be fair with the records, though, uh, the the entire Ashanti region is noted for uh, being the uh, you know stronghold of your political party, the New Patriotic Party. Why then uh, the fixation on uh, Dr. Matteo Pukupempe, particularly when you have so many other MPs who who can boast of you know uh, the same percentage of votes that comes through um, for for the New Patriotic Party in the Ashanti region. Okay, so th this is why Napo stands tall, because it's not just Ashanti. Uh, you can see we are from Vota, and we are even calling for Napo. It tells you the extent to which uh, Napo's influence goes. Uh, he goes beyond just the Ashanti. So we are looking at several factors, which Ashanti is one, and someone who also extends to other regions like the Vota, the Northern, the Eastern, and several other regions. And Napo has that track record. We, we know him to have... Uh, been somebody who is always reliable and can be called upon any time. So that is why we are strongly behind uh, Napo. Aside that, he's competent. We, if you are looking for somebody who is very decisive and competent, I think, and, and we think that Napo has that record. You can go on. You saw what happened when he was implementing the free SHS. It was a tough hurdle, but he stood firm. He was very, very convinced that the initiative was a good one. And uh, it came to a point that uh, there are a lot of people who were raising a lot of red flags about the program. And some even felt that the government was not, able to, was not going to implement it. But he was there firm, and we saw the results. And we saw what the free SHS is doing today. And uh, when you go to the energy sector, Napo is still there delivering. So it's not just about the Ashanti factor. It's also about the other factors, the competence level, his, his relationship with the youth, which we've mentioned. He has a very good base with the youth. If you call several regions within the MPP, you know that Napo is not just about uh, uh, the, the Ashanti region alone, but he extends to other places where he touched base with several youths across the country. Mm. And I mean, th this whole issue uh, about uh, pushing for one candidate, particularly when um, Dr. Mahmoud Bamia has asked for more time. Uh, I recall that meeting happening at Alisa Hotel uh, a couple of days back uh, where he put before, you know, the leading uh, members of the party that he needs more time to decide. By putting up a candidate, don't you feel that you'll be distracting, um, you know, the vice president from making uh, a very firm decision? No, we are not trying to distract the vice president. We are with the vice president. In fact, we want the success of the vice president because we want someone that can break the eight. We want someone, uh, we, we want someone that can partner him to break the eight. So as party people, we are going to be part of the campaign in 2024. So we feel that uh, we are at the ground listening to the voices of the people, engaging our colleagues in several constituencies and regions, 
And if you go around, the voice of the people is that if we bring Napo with this, uh, with his exuberance, with his, with, with, with his, 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 the nature of man who, who he is, he will be able to help us deliver in 2024. So it's not an, an obstruction or proposing a candidate. It's just what we are uh, getting from the grounds and across several constituencies and, and particularly in the voter region here. Mm. Uh, and the question about, you know, you guys being from uh, the Volta region, this is uh, a part of the country where the NPP is not so much popular. Uh, why not select a candidate from there at least uh, just to draw more numbers from that part of the country? Bad idea? Uh, it would be a bad idea looking at the, the nature of, uh, you know, we have Dr. Baumia. We associate more with Dr. Baumia because we are also from the minority tribe. So uh, Dr. Baumia coming in, we, we are already thinking that we have somebody who is there. But we also need to give assurance to our stronghold also that they also have somebody who will be there for them. So that is why we, are, we, we don't want to take all the glory because we already have Dr. Baumia on our side, which... We know he's also from a minority region mm. within the MPP cycle. If you are looking at the MPP, you know that both the voter and the northern regions are almost counted as minority regions. Mm. So for us, we are aligned in that direction. I see. What's the next line of action for your group, knowing that uh, this is a you know, long-term campaign that you uh, seek to sustain until the selection of a, a running mate to Dr. Mahmoud Obamia? Uh, how do you intend to go about your lobbying process, asking the vice president to make this choice? Uh, we are going to actually, uh, we've been speaking with a lot of uh, people within the party. In the coming days, we'll be visiting the leadership of the party to actually uh, bring in more uh, issues up why we are, uh, and also some of the issues that we are finding on the ground, why Napo will be a very good candidate for us because we are going to a crucial election in 2024. No. No, uh, uh, no political party has ever broken the eight in the history of Ghana. We are the first political party going to do that, Go Allah, in 2024. And if we have to do that, we need somebody with the, 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 the energy, somebody who has the connection with the youth. And, and I believe strongly, Napo has a lot of connection with the youth. If you, if you conduct your interview all over uh, this country, you will notice that Napo has that strong connection among the youth. Mm. And we we'll wait to see, um, you know, what the effect of this uh, will be. Eric Dumanua Kachi speaks for um, the grassroots uh, supporting Ghana's energy minister and Dr. Matthew Buku uh, then asking Dr. Mahmoud Obamia to choose him as the running mate of the new patriotic party going into the 2024 elections. Grateful for your time, but uh, still on the vice president. He's been speaking uh, over the weekend, indicating that his statement uh, with respect to the credit scoring system in Ghana has been misconstrued. Speaking at the 57th congregation of the uh, KNUST a fortnight ago, actually, uh, the vice president was uh, reported to have indicated that Ghanaians can use the Ghana card to buy uh, cars under the credit scoring system. Well, the comment has since generated some mixed reactions. The credit scoring system predicts the credit behavior, including the likelihood to pay back loans on time, uh, which will be based uh, on that information uh, of an individual forming your credit report. Responding to the reactions on the back of this comment, the vice president indicated that with the cooperation from the central bank, Ghana is close to introducing an individualized credit scoring system that will allow risks to be differentiated. We have in Ghana been the lack of a, an effective credit system as compared to what we see in most of the advanced countries. Uh, in Ghana, when the, you receive your paycheck, that is really what you try to rely on for the rest of the month. Um, but many other jurisdictions, uh, the credit system works effectively to increase your consumption possibilities. So I was making the statement that one of the things that we don't have currently in Ghana is a credit scoring system that the credit reference agencies would normally do. And that statement that I made was, of course, a truism. And surprisingly, some people wanted to disagree with that statement, even disagreeing with the regulator, the central bank, 
which was saying we don't have that system in Ghana, a credit individualized credit scoring system. But now with the cooperation of the central bank, I think we are very close uh, next year to introducing an individualized credit scoring system in Ghana that should allow us to differentiate risks between different individuals. And that was the sense in which I said that that individualized credit scoring system will have the Ghana card as that anchor because it's the unique identifier for everybody. And that will then allow uh, credit to be more accessible. And all of the companies here present, uh, most of them who deal in consumer um, products and services will be able to then offer credit to many consumers. Uh, and the Ghana card being the anchor, uh, some people misunderstood that I had said that you can take the Ghana card and go and buy a car, uh, which doesn't make sense. You can take the Ghana card and it will help you get credit. And that helps you to buy a car or any other good for that matter. But the bottom line is that as we formalize the economy, we strengthen our companies, we strengthen the private sector, and we make them more competitive within the context of the AFCFT. Moving on to the NDC, the chairperson of the party, Johnson Asiru Nkete, has described the NDC's policies uh, going into the 2024 election as superior to that of the governing party. Johnson Asiru Nkete explaining why every Ghanaian must buy into the party's proposed 24-hour economy, says that the party will put the country at par with its counterparts, uh, as well as boost uh, industries, which will in turn transform the economy. He was speaking in a yet to be aired interview on PM personality profile. Our opponents are just blowing hot air because uh, that policy appears to have that policy appears to have taken them by storm, and so their reaction suggests that uh, they are this. Uh, this is not a complicated policy to adopt or implement at all. See, industries in Europe and many other places operate 24 hours. True. And we are operating eight hours. And we are supposed to produce things and compete with somebody who is utilizing his infrastructure, everything, for 24 hours. Yeah. So there is, from the beginning, a disconnect that makes us uncompetitive. If we just look at the surface like that, you understand? So what we are saying is that the, there is already some infrastructure that is being underutilized or badly utilized. Okay. Let's take our uh, energy infrastructure, for instance. You see that Ghana is one place where you have uh, so much variance between a low period of energy consumption and peak period of energy consumption okay. within any day. Mm -hmm. There are times when there is peak period. Let's, for the purpose of argument, take maybe a scale of zero to 100. There are times you see that energy consumption in some parts of the day may come to 10, 10%. There are other times, peak periods, when you see that the energy consumption has shot up to 90%. So that variation exists in how we consume our electricity. Mm -hmm. Now, if you get into another economy where they are running 24-hour shift, you see that this variation has been evened out. So instead of maybe varying from 10% to 90%, you have a variation of around 
So it may come down to 40, it may go down to 60. Yep. And then that is how the electricity will be consumed. Mm. Now take these two scenarios and see how much it, it costs to fix the infrastructure for electricity uh, distribution. You don't want, you want 24 hour supply of electricity. So you don't want uh, a scenario where during the peak period there is overload and your system will shut down. Shut down, yeah. Okay. So in putting, in laying the infrastructure, you must lay, you must lay it in such a way that it can capture the peak period and you will still have no problems. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint alone, if you are able, as a matter of policy, to encourage some of the consumers to offload their consumption during peak period mm -hmm. to the, the low period of 10, mm -hmm. and you are able to push that one up, yeah. you bring down the peak uh, numbers, and then you, you, you better have uh, you know, better advantages better utilization yeah. of your facility. Mm -hmm. So if you are implementing 24-hour economy and some of the huge energy con consumers like uh, uh, the steel mills that use a lot of electricity, you encourage them to, to be uh, the, the cement factories and other things, you encourage them to be working during the, the off-peak periods. Yeah. Then they will utilize more of the energy which otherwise you will not be utilizing. Mm -hmm. So it makes good sense to even reduce the tariffs yeah. for them because it inures to the benefits of the oh, whole yes. economy, yeah. it inures to the benefits of the, uh, the power sector and so on. Mm. So by giving them cheap power, <laughs> which could have gone waste anyway, anyway yeah. you are introducing efficiency into the utilization of your energy resources and mm. so on. And be sure to catch a full conversation with uh, General Secretary of the uh, National Democratic Congress, Johnson Asiri Nketiah, when that uh, interview airs on PM personality profile later this week. Uh, but for now, rusty roofing sheets protecting an already wobbly Wooden structure with eroded cement bricks on the sides is the simplest description one can give, uh, uh, of course, uh, to that situation of uh, Christ the Answer RC Basic School at uh, Mepe in the North Town district. With the shortage of teachers, effective learning has been adversely impacted in a number of uh, flooding uh, schooling uh, communities actually in the area. So Clinton Yebois visited the community and has come through with this report. The structure is worn out, weathered and hangs loosely, but accommodates not less than 60 pupils in the school all the years gone by. The classrooms are crafted from standing wood, walled with plain concrete blocks serving as a mini wall. Classes come to an abrupt close when the clouds gather. If the rain will come to the school, we don't have sitting place. So the madam will cross us, then we go. The school is located in the Mepe traditional area. The town looks relaxing with its colorful culture and people. But the quality of education in the area is diminishing. Christ the Answer RC Primary School is one of the few schools in the enclave. Recognizing the insufficiency of educational facilities and educational personnel in these communities. Since 2014, that is nine years down the lane. The situation here has been the same, no improvements. Their predicaments come on the blind side of an abandoned classroom block. This is the structure reported to be the new school block to replace the old dilapidated one. However, according to the assembly member, the structure which is at 70% completion has been left in weeds since 2020. Petias Agbemo Nomenyo is the assembly member and we were hoping that as the contractor was on site, and what he told us, this project will have finished earlier 
for students to move in into the classrooms. But as at now, you can see that the project is uh, at roofing level. So all efforts for the project to be completed are proof future. And as at now, you can see, even at the classrooms, when the school started, we had students about 200. But because of lack of infrastructure, most of them have left the school and parents take the uh, students out of the school. So there are a few ones over here. Uh, as an assembly member, anytime we go to assembly meetings or sometimes I engage the DC on it. And he always assured me they will come to site and then work. But lately I learned the contractor said he's not coming back to site because he has not been paid. So he used his money to build uh, the structure till uh, now. So as he has not been paid, he is not coming back to, to site to continue the work. 33-year-old patient Nyamiche is the only teacher handling all the classes from kindergarten to primary six since 2015. With no remuneration, patience is motivated by the smiles of her pupils to persevere in teaching. But we are two. The, the, person, the, the person that is my headmaster has passed away and I'm here alone without any assistance. But I also I know that if I'm here, the student will become somebody in the future. So I'm just doing the work with that payment. But we are going to a lot of challenges. Sometimes you come to the school. How the environment is, it's difficult that you teach the children. But I put myself down so that the children will become somebody if they like me. So it's like no helping, no assistance in it. So sometimes I find it difficult to come to the school. I sometimes like I just give everything to God. That one day, one day, I also will become somebody. Her situation represents just a visible part of a much larger problem the shortage of teachers in the township. Here at Open Heavens Grace Academy, the children are excited to learn, but their classrooms become noisy and full because there are no teachers. And the few teachers here trying to engage the students have to teach as many subjects as possible. The number of teachers is not commensurate with the workload at the school, impeding the ability to cover the entire syllabus. Uh, I teach all the subjects. Sometimes, as a human being, know it's not all the subjects that you can be good in it. But because of lack of teachers, that we must force and go around, search for the rest, and make sure we teach them. Because the children cannot be in the crowd that teaching the rest of the subjects. So sometimes before we finish, we make tired. The shortage of teachers has become more pronounced as Dagome Ele Basic School shuts down after 25 years of being deprived of teachers. Where we are standing used to be a JHS block where people have actually completed, but now the school has been closed down due to the lack of teachers. So we became worried and tried but did not get an encouraging outcome. To fill the void left, the situation is seemingly being alleviated through the benevolence of volunteers and temporary teachers. Builders Foundation, our main aim is to supply teachers to help augment the challenges within the school and within the community. That is the basic reason why I was brought in. I've been here since I met it. I'm in charge of the ICT aspect for the lower the lower primary. Because of the limitations, the limitations, some of the children have low absorption rate. Residents are appealing for a better condition. So we are pleading with government now as they know the future of every ward depends on school. So when you do go to school you have no future. So we are pleading with them to come to the aid of the community and then we'll help them finish the infrastructure so that students can move in quickly to improve their education. We would be very happy if we could get help from the government or any 
NGO. Because this school, academically, they, they, they are doing well. They are doing well, but uh, because of all these pertinent issues, uh, the academic work, for my assessment, is going down. Because you don't have teachers in the school for maybe two years and uh, sometimes a term. Then those teachers leave the school and the new teacher come. Uh, it doesn't help. Educationally, it doesn't help. Reporting for Joy News, Clinton, Yabua. And back here in the capital, it's just uh, two weeks to the Christmas festivities and the beautiful lights you usually see on the principal streets of Accra during the festive period are uh, back. Light up the city has become an integral part of the Yuletide uh, celebrations. Of course, uh, the gleaming lights uh, that adorn the Liberation Circle and also uh, the stretch from the Akoje interchange uh, to the central business district of Accra and other areas uh, of the city spark a festive mood for many uh, other activities to happen. Maxila Baba was at the launch of the uh, 2023 edition of the event and our reports. Some participants of the Christmas parade, which incorporated the rich Ghanaian culture, it preceded the launch of the 2023 Light Up the City with participants singing and dancing on the principal streets of Accra. Children from Adabraka, Choco, and other parts of the capital had a joyful feel of the Christmas celebrations too as they participated in the parade. sounds of Christmas carols filled the air at the main event. Speaking at the 2023 launch of Light Up the City, CEO of Chandel Limited and the brain behind the decorations, Afia Moru said she's hopeful that soon other regions will also get to benefit from the joy the Christmas lights bring. We are pleased to partner the GTA in this exciting development by also introducing the vibrant Light Up Parade as a new addition to our fast-growing Light Up initiative. It is our hope that today, with Ghana Tourism Authority and the relevant complementary agencies, this initiative would be a well-sought-after addition to move from Accra to various cities. This year, we have the pleasure of hosting over 300 children from the community and orphanages to join in the parade and many of our sponsors have donated gift items to make their celebration even more special. The success and security of this program would also not be complete. As we wrap up the year, I wish to leave you with a simple message. Christmas is not about the things we have buy or the gifts we receive. It is about the love we give and the hearts we touch. Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Tourism Authority, Akwistia Jiman, is optimistic. Lights up the parade will become bigger and an important event on Ghana's Christmas calendar. Everybody has to be part of the celebration and seeing that kids from Jamestown, from Osu, from Adabraka, were all part of the celebration today is something that we must applaud. And I believe that working with Jandel and all the, other, all the other partners, we will be able to hold the torch and make sure that going forward, light up the parade, light up the city, and the parade that we saw today is something that will grow in leaps and bounds and become a very iconic event for Ghana. It is the fifth consecutive time Ecobank is sponsoring Light Up the City. Yes, a rep. We later expanded this into other cities, Kumase and Takurade, and remarkably, and also for our Muslim brothers in the country, we did the first Ramadan edition 
um, also, and we will continue to do this. Four, three, two, one, and zero! There we go! Take a look, take a look, take a look, people! The celebration is everywhere, but remember that there are some families out there in this festive season who may not be privileged, and that's why your superstation, Joy 99.7 FM, is uh, bringing you the Christmas hour, seeking to feed at least 10 families, less privileged families during this uh, season. Kofi Hayford, host of The Overdrive, is joining us. And Kofi, you know, we're all happy, we're all excited about Christmas, but we also need to care for the yeah, less privileged. Yeah, that's true. Food. Absolutely true. That's what's starting about this program. But let's talk about it. Right. What's the Joy Christmas Hour? Okay. Yeah, so the Joy Christmas Hour is basically an hour on radio yeah. where we get to accept entries from um, people that will nominate deserving families. And mm. when I say that, I don't mean all other families are not deserving right. of you know, uh, meals, but we're trying to feed families who really need it yeah. this Christmas, mm. this Christmas. Yeah. And so uh, between now and the 22nd of December, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have the Joy Christmas Hour that runs from 1.15 p.m. to 2 p.m. Yeah. on Joy 99.7 FM. Mm. Host of the show is uh, Doreen Ando. Oh. And uh, yeah, we're going to be having calls and text messages mm -hmm. or whatsapp messages to our for these families to be yes, nominated. for these families to be nominated so we are asking people yeah. that listen to joy fm and even those that do not listen right now mm -hmm. that make it a point to listen send in your entries via whatsapp yeah. to 055 111 mm -hmm. or you yeah. can call us doreen ando is going to put the numbers out it's 0302 216 540 while she is on the show Thanks. now you are going to tell us um the story of a family that you know that you think really needs it and if you see the emphasis yeah, that i'm putting on yeah. really you know so um yes we're going to be making merry and share in the fun and uh, spread love but we also want to put smiles on the faces of families that really need it but at the end of the day they're going to say that oh thank you so much for doing this for indeed us. and that's why we're calling it the joy christmas uh, right. Here, what, thank you right uh, for uh, but but let me, let me yes but we need yes, to I leave have, uh, you know the, the contacts before right so yes. the number is zero three zero two two one six five four one. we take it slowly so they can you know follow oh i thought the, i was on radio. The, oh, radio i know that i know that <laughs> the temptation is always there right. so once more it's 0302 mm -hmm. yeah. or you can send us the uh, story to us on WhatsApp 055 But please note yeah. that we're going to have 10 entries every day and that we're going to select five of them every day. Then at the end of the day, right. we're going to have 10 families. And this is in support, um, you know, from um, Yango, who are going to do the delivery on the 25th oh. of December, as well as Lunch Avenue, who are preparing the meals. So it's a whole platter yeah. of different meals that we believe that families who really need it are good. Kofi, I think we've got great company. And of right. course, uh, you out there watching us on TV, you can just be a part of it and join in that celebration of the Joy Christmas. Uh, Kofi Hayford, thank you. Thank you, thank for, you for having joining me. Us. And that's all we have for you in this package of the polls. I'm Lester Sudan. Log on to myjoyaline.com. We have updates there for you. It's been a pleasure uh, serving you here on the polls.